uncertain is no pleasant feeling. And when you have goals to hit, it's frustrating aimlessly working and not getting what you want. My name is Coach Donald, and if you find yourself in this place, GHP's online coaching may be a great fit for you. Whether that is prepping for your next races, season, or competitions, handling a nagging injury, or simply looking to become your best healthy self, our remote coaching is set up for you to win. From customizable training delivered seamlessly to your phone, guidance on injury and nutrition, accountability, and even video training sessions, having a coaching relationship with someone who actually cares about you and your family goes a long way. Connect with me to create a proven success plan and see our offerings. Leave your information on my website or send a DM to get started and learn why life-changing fitness is not simply a motto, but a way of living. During this couple of days was that Pacha Foundation succeed to recharge my battery. I'm a very, very happy guy. You know sometimes you are doing things and uh, you don't know you continue as usual but when I came with Pacha Foundation with all the talk with all the advice I succeed to recharge my battery and have new objectives so now I'm going to raise all my actions I'm going to do more and I pray God that he helped me to continue to do this uh, amazing work uh, I think with the help of all those who promise we are going to do more thank you for all thank you Pacha thank you Baboni, thank you all the people who did their best to make my stay marvelous. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, hello, and welcome to A Freak Today Live. On behalf of the Patcha Foundation, I would love to invite you to our coronavirus live panel brought to you by several millennial professionals. We are so excited to chat with you today and just um, have a discussion. I know many of us are concerned about how to move forward from this um, crazy time, but indeed we will move forward. We are heading into recovery mode, um, and so, on behalf of the Pacha Foundation and A Freak Today, I welcome you. Thank you for tuning in with us. 
And um, I thank the junior associates. Um, I am the lead junior associate of the Patchett Foundation. So we have put on lots of great information for you and we cannot wait to share with you. So now I will turn it on to Khadija Adamu who will be our first moderator. Hello everyone and welcome. As Raina said, my name is Khadija and I will be one of your moderators for today. So to get started, I wanna introduce the lovely panelists that we have with us. So our first panelist is Ms. Jasmine Belhin. Now Jasmine is a licensed mental health counselor from the state of New York. She maintains multiple roles as a psychotherapist, case manager, and a researcher. Her area of focus is anxiety disorders, relational issues and familial changes. Jasmine is, a leading, Jasmine is leading a research team that is investigating the strong black women schema and how it affects black women in choice of coping strategies. Jasmine is passionate about breaking down the stigma that remains in the black community about mental health and recognizes how therapy can be an asset for the community, especially in regards to treating trauma. Jasmine, if you wanna say hello, feel free. <laughs> Hi everybody, thank you for joining us and I'm so excited to be able to share with you today and just help everybody get informed. Thank you for having me right now and everyone else. Thank you so much Jasmine, we look forward to hearing from you in a few minutes. Next up, I'm going to introduce Mr. Kendrick Sanker. Now, Mr. Kendrick started his career as a financial advisor with Northwestern Mutuals in downtown DC in 2017. His story starts in Sweetland, Maryland, where he was raised by his mother and grew up with a passion for sports and leadership. He attended Georgetown Preparatory School, where he boarded all four years and played football, basketball, and ran track. There was no day off. He accepted an offer to play football at the illustrious Hampton University, okay, real HU, and earned a BA in communications in 2016. Kendrick specializes in working with attorneys, physicians, and consultants as he's conducted over 3,000 meetings with clients across the country. In his free time, he enjoys working out, cooking, and spending time with his friends and family members. Mr. Sanker, please say hello to everyone. Thank everybody for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. And again, we look forward to speaking with you in a few minutes. Give me a second. Let me queue up my next panelist here. Do, do, do. I apologize. All right, next up we have Miss Jessica Ornsby. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you pronounced it perfectly. Thank you so much. So Miss Jessica Ornsby is the founding and managing attorney of AO Law Group in Washington, DC. AO Law Group's practice areas focus on family law, landlord tenant, and business litigation. Prior to founding a o Law Group, Jessica worked as a federal corporate tax associate at a law firm based in Washington, D.C., where she litigated complex tax matters and advised large companies on the tax implications of various transactions. Jessica also litigated family law matters on a pro bono basis, which sparked her interest in practice areas that hit close to home. We love a girl who knows where she's from. During law school, Jessica gained valuable experience as a law clerk at the United States Department of Labor, where she issued opinions related to EEOC claims. At the United States Department of Justice, Jessica served as a legal intern within the Civil Frauds Division, litigating multi multi-million dollar whistleblower came. Okay. At the Eastern District of Virginia, Jessica served as a summer law clerk for the Honorable Anthony J. Trenga. Ja drafting opinions on a variety of cases before the court. Jessica also clerked for Fay Law Group before joining as an associate, where she litigated a variety of matters, including civil rights, labor, and employment, and products liability. In addition to her legal practice, Jessica serves as a tenant advocate for Rockville City's Council's 
Landlord Tenant Commission. Ooh, mouthful. Jessica also participates in various pro bono clinics and is an active member of her churches in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Jessica, please tell everyone hello. Hello, everyone. It is so great to be here, and I look forward to discussing these very important matters with you today. Thank you so much, Jessica. So our next panelist that we have, our next panelist that we have is Mr. Donald Robinson. Donald has been an athletic coach to many over the years. He is currently the owner of Global Human Performance, a personal training studio in Pittsburgh, PA, and also coaches high school and youth and track and field, which I suggest y'all hit him up because I know you finished all your quarantine snacks. Donald has consulted for coaches in Kenya for the last four years on improving their athletic performance, training, and keeping athletes from being injured often via yearly clinics held in Nairobi and online communication. A global man, we stand. Donald, please tell everyone hello. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. Looking forward to being able to help make sure that we have good resources to do the best that we can during these times. Thank you so much. And for our last but definitely not least panelist, we have Dr. Alexia Gaffney. She is a triple board certified infectious disease subspecialist, internist, and pediatrician. I'm going to emphasize triple board because what? She is above and beyond this, a mother, a speaker, an author, and a coach. Dr. Alexia invited the world into her life when she was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 37. She publicly shared her journey through social media as she underwent a double mastectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy for her breast cancer treatment. Cancer has transformed her life in her worldview, and she has been healing and transforming herself and others through her speaking, teaching, and writing. Dr. Alexia also uses, utilizes advocacy via conferences, community engagement, and social media to educate at-risk communities and the general public about lifestyle disease prevention and management. She is a firm believer in what she calls treat, eat, drink, and think, approach to cancer and healing. Out of her pain, she, de she developed Warrior Wellness and Nutrition, a nutritional supplement line. Out of her pain, she was able to, with this line, create products and services to help those experiencing cancer treatments and a health coaching program for cancer patients and their families. She has utilized her social media platforms on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which will be shared later, to share her medical motivation and healthy influence. Excuse me. Here, she not only gives glimpses and insights into her life as a physician and mother, she thrives and helps her family cope with her treatment as well. She utilizes these platforms to give hope and encouragement to breast cancer, survivor, breast cancer survivors and their families through and beyond the treatment process. Everyone, please say hello to Dr. Alexia. Hi, and thank you so much for having me on. Um, thank you for allowing me to share my voice, my expert opinion, my personal opinions, and I look so I'm so looking forward to the exchange of ideas and the exchange of information across all expect all perspectives, excuse me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So again, thank you so much to all of the panelists that are joining us today. And I'm going to start out with a question that can go and should go to everyone that is on the air with us right now. Panelists, we can't talk about health without first checking in with ourselves. As Black people, you know, we got, really got to check in with ourselves and hold ourselves accountable and, you know, extend our own personal experiences to one another. So mentally, physically, and emotionally, how are you all holding up in this pandemic? Doc, uh, Ms. Jasmine, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, I think... I can speak for a lot of different people. I think it's a lot of different emotions that are coming up. So while this is a time to catch up on rest and all of those different things, it's still a very scary time because 
this is it's traumatic people's lives are constantly changing and there's a lot of unknown that we're dealing with right now and with news consumption working from home social distancing i think it has been pretty tough um i currently live in new york and my family is all in virginia so i have not been able to see my family so that's kind of been tough and all of my friends and support system but I think I've been trying to use this time to really focus on my self care and like my well being and making sure I'm doing the best that I can to to move forward in this time. Thank you. Fantastic. Mr. Kendrick, I'm gonna move on to you. How are you how are you holding up? Yeah, I would agree with Jasmine. I think you know, people are finding themselves a lot more during this period where they're doing things that they've always wanted to do, but didn't have the time to do before. So maybe it's a passion of theirs in athletics, or maybe it's a passion of theirs in reading or writing or whatever that passion might be. I think a lot of folks are now finding things within themselves that they didn't do before. Um, specifically me, you know, just, you know, learning more, having more time to study, regards to finance, um, during times in which, I mean, I, 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 when we talk with clients, we say you're on the roller coaster ride of life. And I think this is the time really where the roller coaster has stopped for people to actually put a pause on a day-to-day -day activity. So I've been enjoying it, taking a lot from it and adapting. So it's been a good time. I'm glad you're enjoying it. The roller coaster is definitely an excellent adjective um, that I would use for my own personal you know, coming to terms with what's going on. Uh, Miss Jessica, how are you holding up? Um, so I also have been enjoying being able to just be at home. Um, I have a pretty extensively set up home workspace that I tried to make comfortable when I set it up and I didn't expect to use it as much, <laughs> but I'm really glad that I did. Uh, what's been challenging is I'm actually due with my second child on Tuesday. And so <laughs> it has been a very interesting last few weeks with doctor's appointments and trying to stay, you know, as safe as possible. Um, I do go back and forth between saying I should be very productive because I'm at home and saying I should just take this time to rest. So I have days where I work like a crazy person and then I'm like, you don't need to do that. <laughs> Relax. Um, I have been spending a lot of time with my son, which has been great. Um, you know, usually he's at school. Now he's here with me all the time. <laughs> um, so it's been really a mixed bag. But honestly, for me, spiritually, it's been the hardest because I'm so used to being in church and having that experience. And that's been a little I miss that. <laughs> Yeah, I completely understand. Uh, it's definitely been an adjustment and my heart goes out to you parents that have to transition into online school and having your children run around every waking moment of the day. Good luck. All right. So, Mr. Donald, how are you doing? How are you holding up? Um, I'm doing well. Different days, you know, bring different feelings. Um, Overall, it's been a necessary break from the long days that are like at the gym or at the track and different things to where now everything's at home. My interactions with my clients have gone up a lot just in communicating to them. But um, as far as like having to physically do a lot of stuff, that's calmed down a lot. So I'm sleeping better. I'm not waking up this one morning to like coach. So like that whole thing has been wonderful. And a lot of time to just reflect and look at where do we want to kind of go with, with the business, with my life, and, you know, being able to make some changes. So that's been really nice. And, you know, kind of looking at um, what Kendrick even said, you know, having time to study things that are directly related to my craft, but other things that I like to study, but I just have not had a lot of time for. So those are the good days, the bad days, you know, sometimes a little bit of anxiety, like I'm not a house person. Like I... You know, I'm not a homebody at all. I've been home more this whole COVID time than probably the last, like, six months to a year. So that part's, like, really rough. But I've been trying to go out and run a lot, which kind of helps me stay sane. 
Thank you so much for sharing. No, yeah, I am an extrovert, so I definitely miss outside. Um, I miss my people. Cinco de Mayo is coming up, so it's going to be interesting. Um, but again, <laughs> let's keep it moving. Dr. Alexia, how are you doing? How are you holding up? So I um, vacillate between being extremely calm and extremely stressed. Um, I feel like I'm always operating from one extreme or the other. I am an extroverted introvert. So the cancellation of things has been um, peaceful for me to not have to constantly jump up and run, especially on the weekends. However, um, but that cancellation came with stresses as well. So cancellation of paychecks um, and cancellation of networks, networking and time to bond and connect with other people, um, especially with my family, as well as with um, my support system and my network as it relates to my cancer fam. Um, but also just, you know, calm and peace because I understand what's going on. I have the ability to um, help in the efforts to take care of people as well as to stop the spread of the COVID infection. And so I'm like operating at one extreme or the other. Um, unlike most people, I do have to leave the house to physically go to work every day. And even work has been quite different because I am working in three different ways at one time. So managing patients in the hospital, managing patients in my office physically, as well as managing patients via telephone and via telehealth platforms. Um, so that has added a new level to my practice. Um, but it's been interesting. Overall, I'm just grateful to be able to serve others and just to live and walk in my purpose. And that is very satisfying for me. I love to hear it. Love to hear it. And lastly, Ms. Raina, how are you holding up? How are you holding up? Hello, hello. I am holding up well. Um, I actually work for the judiciary. So it is an interesting time. Um, I just graduated law school um, last May. So I am working in the judiciary and um, working under a judge at this time. So I hear cases. Um, there's not a lot to be heard. Um, I did go into chambers earlier this week, which was super stressful. Um, the court has been trying to handle emergency matters. Um, some things are not so much of an emergency. Of course, we are all um, going through this pandemic together, especially um, uh, Ms. Ornsby will speak later about the family law matters and the different things that are going on in the community. Um, but families have been really affected during this time. Um, and we'll uh, get to that in a moment. But it's just been an interesting time. I miss working. Um, however, I am happy to be resting and just enjoying kind of focusing on myself for once. Like I said, I'm at the judiciary, so I serve the public most of the time. Um, I'm interacting with not only um, my colleagues who are counsel, but as well as just overall operation and dealing with multiple personalities in a day. Um, so I do miss interacting with the public, but it's been nice to kind of take care of me for one. So, yeah. Lovely. That is an excellent transition into my first official question. So, Jasmine, you mentioned that this time period you are really focusing on your own, you know, self-care, which I think is, we've come to find that as mental health has been on the forefront of a lot of conversations in the media recently, especially with this pandemic, self-care is the, the buzz phrase that's sort of thrown out, self-care, self-care. But as a mental health counselor, what exactly does self-care mean? What does it look like? And how are people, you know, if your self-care used to be going to the nail salon and the nail salon's closed, how are we to adapt? So yeah, so self-care is a buzzword. And I think a lot of people get a little confused with self-care. So self-care isn't accidentally doing something for yourself. Self-care is intentionally doing something for yourself. So planning to do something for your mind, your body, your spirit, however that you need to fulfill yourself. But it's something that adds to you. Um, a lot of people, result to things that 
may take away from them or things of that nature. And I wouldn't say that is self-care, but self-care can look like, let's say you said going to the nail shop, love going to the nail shop. So this has been a hard time, but I found that maybe doing my nails myself, maybe doing a pedicure at home has been kind of helpful or taking time to read a book turning off all of the screens, praying if um, whatever your spiritual or religious background is. Um, but self-care is something intentional. So I think that it varies person to person. It's a very individual thing. But this is the perfect time to get to know yourself, to figure out what self-care looks like for you. Because self-care might be going shopping, but shopping also takes away from your money. So maybe we should find some self-care that we could do at home as well when we want to save or we're budgeting. So I think this is a perfect time to really get to know yourself and figure out what this looks like for you. Is there anything sort of a pressing topic that your clients have been coming to you with in this time? Like anything, uh, a, uh, not a, an issue that is reoccurring or you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people are experiencing anxiety about what is happening so especially people who do have mental health diagnoses this is a very strange and uncertain time because people who have mental illnesses they need routine they need a structured routine so like let's say if you have bipolar disorder or if you have an anxiety disorder routine is everything so this is kind of throwing everybody's brain off whack and so I think that's the biggest thing about this time, whether you have a mental illness, whether you're just trying to pass through. I think finding a routine has been the most important thing to manage the anxiety. So having some type of structure in your day can make it make it a little bit more normal as as normal as possible, because, you know, we are experiencing something like this. Thank you. So, Mr. Robinson, I'm going to switch to you. So. On that topic of anxiety, I know there are a lot of people, the majority of people even, who find working out to be something that can relieve stress for them, especially in this time period when, you know, the days are looking dark and it's looking long. You don't know when the, day, the end is coming. So how are you managing that stress within your clients? I can't go to the gym. How am I going to keep active? What should I keep? What should I be doing? So... What I found was that the answer to that question really differs a lot more than I thought it would with some of them. So in making the transition when the state of Pennsylvania told us we had to shut down and I had to immediately shift to online, you know, we gave them a few different options. We have an app on our, on their, on our phones where they have workouts on there. Then we also decided to do some like video conferencing uh, workout sessions. And then on the other hand, they made, made some pre-recorded workouts to actually provide them. And they all went different paths with that. Some people, a lot of that anxiety came in the actual interaction. They wanted to interact with me. They wanted to interact with the other people. And so a lot of them have, you know, just flocked to doing the video conferencing stuff and nothing else. And other people are like, I just need a routine of something to do. And so some of my clients have like small home gyms. Some are like, you know, they have a couple pieces of equipment. Some of them have like, wow, that's pretty nice. And they kind of take the app and they go, you know, they go to town with that. Um, some people, I have one member, he, uh, he went back home to Singapore. And so he had to do a two week quarantine in there. And so we had to work on putting together a schedule because while he still had to work from home on a 12 hour difference on a time schedule, we still had to get his, you know, fitness piece together. So working with them on either getting them active with the video, um, conferencing on, or for some people it's just checking in on them and like having somebody who's constantly talking to them and making sure that they're okay or like helping them build a schedule um jasmine mentioned you know being able to have that routine and a lot of them just threw their routines out the door and so like i have to like be that coach for some of them to help put that together now donald i know since we're all inside you know this is sort of like a new year's resolution time period people are taking it as that you know i'm a i'm gonna merge a new person when outside opens up so how would you advise people that are trying to get their fitness game right get their health in order 
But again, the resources are limited. Like if I wanted to start, could you give some advice to the starters? I always take the approach of do the minimum that you can and keep building from there. So one thing that's very accessible to because it's springtime is go outside and walk. Um, I go out and walk multiple times a day. I advise them, go out, you know, especially if you're not having to work full time anymore, go out, get 30 minutes of walking and get an hour of walking in, get a morning walk in it, uh, evening or afternoon walk, which gets you going and actually being in motion and motivates you to do something else. So then you can say, all right, you know what? I'm going to do 25 squats today, 25 sit-ups, 25 push-ups. And you can just set that low barrier to just do that day after day after day. And then as your confidence builds, you can keep adding to that. But going for a 20 minute walk and doing, you know, 25 squats and a few other exercises might only take half an hour of your day, but it's going to provide you a lot of benefit. And as this situation progresses on, you're able to do more, you're more confident, then you can transfer that to going into the gym and actually feeling like you can start by, you know, being a little bit in shape. Because some people don't like to go to the gym at all in shape. Now you have some momentum there. And that momentum means a lot. Thank you so much. Dr. Alexia, I'm coming to you with our next couple of questions. So we're talking about health and how people are staying together and having peace of mind in this time period. So what are you seeing with the many people you reach, especially in the cancer field? How are people reacting and how are they coping? So people literally have to be coached and guided into coping because the initial response has been panic, fa fear, and anxiety. Um, specifically in the cancer community, um, a lot of surgeries have been canceled for people, uh, for people trying to prevent cancers. Their preventative surgeries have been um, rescheduled and disrupted. And people who actively have cancer um, disruptions in their treatment. I know for my hospital, we turned our cancer center into a mini hospital um, and redistributed our chemo nurses to hospital floors. So we either had to send patients outside of our system, so loss of familiarity with the providers you already know and trust, or send them you know, over an hour or more away from where they usually receive care in order to get it. Um, so we've been providing a lot more than just medicine in terms of offering diagnoses and supportive care and treatment, but also um, offering a lot of just handholding and guidance to help people cope because there's just been so much overwhelm and stress and anxiety about this whole situation. Now, be it that you are a doctor and you are one of the essential workers, you have to leave your house every day to get mm -hmm. to work. How are you managing your own? Did you experience any anxiety when this all came crashing down? Absolutely. So um, we do everything that we can to protect ourselves. So in my office, I, every single patient now has to be called up in advance of their visit. And we have to go through this huge list of screening questions to sort out, is it likely that this patient could bring COVID into our office? And even having done the screening, the reality is, is we have to assume everyone has it. So does the patient have um, a mask to wear into the office? How can we get one on them as quickly as possible? How do we keep patients six feet apart from one another? Um, and so there's this added level of protection that we need to make sure we're not bringing um, people in who can spread the infection to us, but I'm the only person leaving my household. So I need to be safe to make sure that I don't bring it home from work or bring it home from the grocery store or the pharmacy. So um, I'm gearing up and wearing mask and personal protective equipment in my office when I'm in direct contact with patients, as well as when I just simply leave my home like everybody else's. And so simple things like, you know, stripping your clothes off um, in the garage so that you're not bringing home the germs from the office or the healthcare setting home. Um, and then just trying to find also the balance. So I've had to shift my entire work schedule because I have an eight-year-old daughter 
who is learning remotely and I need to give her some guidance and get her set up and going for that as well. And it's challenging as a mother to pull myself away from my parental responsibility to then go into the office and put my doctor hat on and helping my staff cope. My staff has anxiety about coming to work every single day and what they're taking home to their families. So it is, uh, it's, it's like running on a hamster wheel. Like the wheels are constantly spinning and trying to think of all the possibilities and trying to put out fires. It's, it's a very loaded situation. No. Yeah. And my heart really goes out to the essential workers and the small business owners during this time, because you guys are in hyperdrive and hyper mode. How for my healthcare professionals, but really everyone on the panel, Mm -hmm. how has it been for you to transition your your work how has it been for you to transition what you do and learn how to still provide effective services to your clients in all of your many fields but now it has to be behind a screen or it has to be through the internet how how has that transition been for you all have you experienced some stress and anxiety over that and how have you managed that go ahead jessica um so my job a lot of in order for me to get the end result it's direct client work i'm in court i'm in a mediation i'm in a settlement meeting um and the inability to go to court with a client that leaves a lot of anxiety for a lot of my clients um their cases are on hold and they know that I'm working, but they don't see it. <laughs> so if they get an invoice that says, oh, I was researching or I was drafting something, um, it's, it's more difficult for them to understand what they're paying for. So what I have done is I'm spending a lot more time communicating through our client portal putting updates for everything. You know, if I talk to someone, you're going to know I spoke to them today so that they're not wondering you know, what, what's happening? Um, I don't even know when the courts are going to reopen. Um, we have tentative dates, but, you know, even with the courts reopening, it's going to be in stages. Um, another difficulty is I have a lot of clients who are not comfortable not seeing me. Um, the If I say, oh, we can have a teleconference, they want to they want to be in my office they want to you know have that tangible interaction um i have a lot of clients who are supposed to be receiving mental health support um and they're unable to see their therapists they're unable to see their caseworkers um and as a result i'm getting the sort of the windfall of that um where they're asking me to fix things that i can't because i'm not a mental health professional um, I have cases that require the involvement of mental health care and those individuals, those appointed advocates and therapists, they can't meet in person. Um, and it, it's causing sort of a little bit of confusion and insecurity within the cases where we don't really know what to do, um, as attorneys. And, and so it's, I'm trying to do as much tangible work, like, here's a memo on this, here's a motion on this, so they can see that something's happening, but it's really not the same. It's, it's just, it isn't. And how, like, what do you, what do you tell your clients when they come to you and they say, no, Jess, I need to see you in the office right now. So right before this panel, um, I got a flurry of emails from one client who's supposed to receive services. They have not been receiving their services and they're saying, I need to see you on Monday. I go in the hospital on Monday. You cannot see me on Monday. <laughs> and they're like, well, I need to talk to someone. Can I see you today? No, you cannot see me. <laughs> and it's, I have to be firm, but also um, empathetic and understand that we all are going through this. And from my perspective as, you know, as expectant mother attorney, I have to also be sensitive to this individual who is stuck at home, who isn't seeing their therapist, who isn't seeing their caseworker, and they just want to see someone who's helping them. Um, so I said, I can do a Zoom call. You know, you can, you can call me later, but I cannot meet with you. Um, and I have also been trying to find more therapists who can help my clients remotely. 
So I've been building that network significantly actually during um, COVID, which has been helpful for a lot of my clients. So for people that still have to, like Jessica, still have to interact with people face to face, like Dr. Alexia as well, how are you all managing having to set that boundary that was no longer there? Are you finding trouble with it? Is there any advice or even a phrase that you can give the rest of us to say, you know, yeah, I want to serve you, but six feet, like, I need you to get out of my face, please. Like, how are you all managing that boundary with your clients? So you absolutely have to continuously remind people because people just forget. Um, I would say set up just multiple levels of reminders. So we're going out of our way to call people and say, don't forget, don't just walk in the office, stay in your car, call us from the car, and we'll let you know is if the waiting room is clear or if there's an available exam room. Um, we've also put a sign on the door because people aren't in the habit of calling people from the car when they go anywhere to see if it's safe to come in. Um, so we put a sign on the door. And even with that being said, people still just barge right in. So, you know, thankfully we have a glass door between outside and our waiting room space. And, you know, we could literally say, hold up, like put that mask on, pull it up over your nose. But we have, we also remind people we are here to serve you. We want to give you the help that you need. We want to give you the answers you need. We want to give you the services you need in the way in that is most comfortable for you. However, we must protect ourselves. We must protect our other patients, clients, customers, and we just have to honor one another as human beings. I think what happens is people get so caught up in their own personal needs, they forget to consider everyone else outside of themselves. And so we just give them a gentle reminder that we want to protect you, but we also want to protect our own health and well-being. And we want to protect the health and well-being of the other people that we take care of and serve as well. So just constant reminders. Jasmine, how about you? Um, I can definitely attest to that. Um, setting boundaries during this time, it's, it's difficult because setting boundaries is difficult anyway, but it's so important because we absolutely cannot serve our clients and serve the community if we aren't well ourselves. So I think it's, it's necessary to set those boundaries. And, you know, just like you have a work time during the day, you kind of have to enforce that a little bit in a more gentle tone that, okay, so today I'm working from here or let's set up an appointment so we can talk. But you also absolutely have to take care of yourself. So you do have to set those boundaries. And as um, Dr. Alexis said, people do forget. And especially since things are so scary, people are forgetting anymore and they're more concerned with themselves and their family. And I don't think it's from a selfish aspect, but just more of making sure they're okay as well. So I think it's just necessary to communicate and let them know and be a little vulnerable. Like I am a person just like you. I get sick just like you. Um, and I think when you're in a professional role, a lot of people forget that you are also a human and you also have your anxiety and your things that are going on and you're dealing with things and dealing with family. So I think you kind of have to be a little transparent and let them know like, hey, I, I feel anxious too. This has been scary for me too. This has been uncertain for me too, but we're going to figure it out. We're going to work it out together. We're going to set up an appointment. We're going to make sure we talk about this um, next session or this session. Like in, so I, I think being in a professional role, you also have to be just a little bit of flexible during this time because People need that that safety net. They need to know that, like, okay, like, we can talk about this next time, and, and we'll make sure to bring it up. So I think boundaries are it's hard to set during this time, but it's so necessary. Thank you. Kendrick, I'm really interested to see how this transition has been for you as well. How do you – how how are you still providing that same service to your clients that I'm sure – there's nothing like sitting next to your financial advisor and watching them point at each of the numbers and be like, this, 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 this. So how are you still providing the same level of service in this different time? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, believe it or not, so a lot of financial advisors have 
most of their clients are actually out of state than in state. That's, that's a common thing that a lot of folks don't know. They think it is uncommon to have an, another advisor that's out of state. Now, you bring up a good point. You know, having an advisor in state where you're able to build a relationship, you can physically see that person, you know, you can explain things visually better up front, definitely adds a lot of value. Um, and to be completely like 100% working from home, um, it has it has its challenges. You know, you're not able to have that connection with folks like, like you used to, but um, just like any other challenges, you learn to adapt, whether that's through a Zoom or being more uh, connected connected through a phone call and really, you know, asking that that person questions versus, I would say, versus going straight through a financial planning meeting, you actually have to take a step back and ask that person how they're doing, how their family's doing, because you have to have that understanding. So it has been a little bit of a, of a change, but... Um, overall, it, it hasn't changed as much as people might think in the financial planner world. It's just, I would say it's more a heightened activity. It's a lot more happening just due to um, everything that's going around. Thank you. I had no idea. Like I said, I really just thought me and my financial advisor are going to be best friends and they're going to tell me to, you know, stop spending all my money on lip gloss and stop going to Chick-fil-A. So okay. I'm actually very surprised to find that it's usually just out of town connections. That is very interesting. How have you been able to, I guess, let me try and formulate my words. So now that everything is fully, you're online, you're working from home, you know, at first you hear work from home back when you had to go into work and it's like, yes, I get a good day to work from home. But now that this is all that you have to do, do you find that you also, as the service provider, miss that interaction with your clients that, you know, now that you're home, people are sending you a lot more work than you would have done in the office? These are common things that I'm hearing. How are you, Coach? You, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, before, I feel like life was a bit different because you had certain breaks in between meetings, you know, you get lunch, you know, you had, you had that, that structure. And now... It is more of a back to back to back to back to back activity thing where, you know, at first I was a firm believer that I was the best that I could be in an environment at an office. And now I think a lot of folks understand that the challenges that they think they would have working from home, you're not able to overcome those. In those challenges you've adapted, you've, you've changed your ways, that mentality is gone. So even when I'm talking to coworkers, it's like, I never knew I could do X, Y, and Z at home, and now I, I, I'm making that that switch, and it's it's progress. So for me, um, it's it, it is it's more about being as structured and and setting. I think everybody brought up this point. It's just um, small steps, it's doing something at the minimum, setting up habits, setting up structure um, to be able to to be the best you can be, but also the limitations. So I'm finding myself having. 7 p.m., 8 p.m. meetings. And it's like, I, before, I had a deadline. But now it's like, you also want to be as helpful to folks as you can, but also find your own limitations where it's okay, hey, you know, two hours later, it's going to be tomorrow. So you, you got to condense your time as well. So it's, it, it is, it's a balance. And I think the real important part of finding that balance, one of the important parts of finding that balance is creating a schedule. Donald, you said that you speak to your clients, one in Singapore, many of them, again, away from you, from what used to be a physical, in-person experience. Any advice on how to create schedules for ourselves? I don't know about anybody else, but me personally, now that there is nothing, quote unquote, nothing physically to do, I could lay in bed all day and I struggle actually creating that a schedule for myself. I'll be like, I'll wake up around maybe 10 ish, 12. I'll, you know, knock out a few assignments by two, four. And then I end up at 7 PM, like you said, Kendrick doing work. So Donald, any advice on blocking out the days and still being productive? So one thing I've talked to my uh, members a lot about are creating these anchor points and that's going to, kind of differentiate a lot depending on if you're working like adamantly from home or if you're like literally not working anymore. And so these anchor points are small bits in your day that are going to happen pretty much every day. So I give the example that I have to do Zoom conferencing sessions at nine, one, and six. 
And so those things are not going to change every day. So that allows me to now morph a early morning day, a late morning day, an afternoon and an evening block. And then, you know, depending on now if you're, you're working, figuring out how much liberty do you have over what you're going to actually work on and putting time blocks either by the, the uh, by the hours or by the day. So like there's Mondays and Tuesdays are my heavy work days. Wednesday is like the day that I do personal tasks because I suck at doing those. I'm like, you schedule a day to do personal tasks. And that's Wednesday. And it still has the same hourly flow, but now the days are focused on something different. And that depends on your flow. If you, you know, if you are a little bit more entrepreneurial, you're very, um, you're, you decide your own path at work, then finding a flow that says these hours are for this, these days are for that can work out really well. If you literally are just like not working and you have a whole lot more time on your hands, even when going into some of those reflections when it comes to whether you're um, going to spend some time praying, meditating, or working on a new uh, task or working on a new skill, or just having a set time in the day where like every day at 2 p.m., I'm going to call my mom or I'm going to call my best friend. Even, even having little things like that, my 9 a.m. walk, having those things can help anchor your day so that you have a little bit of foundation to your flow. And then you can build things around that and have some sort of consistent sleep schedule, consistent uh, flow schedule, and time that you know you're not going to have planned to do anything versus having that be the whole day. Thank you. Yeah, that sleep schedule, that's, that's a big one, the sleep schedule. So definitely action points. I will take that into consideration. I hope everybody watching this is also taking notes. Such excellent advice. Thank you all panelists so much for this first session. So I'm gonna field a couple questions from our viewers and then afterwards we're gonna take a commercial break and be right back. So one of the questions we have from our viewers and again, these are all, anyone can answer any of these questions, um, but just by the nature of this question, Dr. Alexi, I think it's coming to you. The question reads, a study showed that referrals have dropped by over 70%. What does that do to cancer diagnoses and the risk of late diagnosis and the downside to that, knowing that with cancer regular screening and early, diagnose, early diagnoses are how the majority of cancers are detected? So what has happened for me, even though I am a subspecialist, I, I do a fair amount of primary care. And I was saying to someone the other day, it's like, I'm the primary care doctor, I'm the ID subspecialist, and now I'm the cancer care doctor. Like I found myself being responsible for ordering studies I've never ordered before, following protocols I've not typically had to follow because you know our cancer center is closed. So even though referrals are down, care is still happening because if you're if you have a primary care provider and that's why it's so important to have one and have a good therapeutic relationship with someone there are things that they can order to help get your care underway can i perform surgery absolutely not you know can i do a biopsy absolutely not but i can gather enough imaging labs and information that would um compel someone whoever it is an interventional radiologist a surgeon um, a surgical oncologist or the medical oncologist to know that, okay, this one cannot wait until it's back to business as usual. So it's important to have a good therapeutic relationship because just because referrals are down does not mean that care is not happening and that cancer care is not happening. Um, just a specific example, I tried to refer a patient to a surgical oncologist for a pancreatic mass. Um, I ended up ordering the imaging. I ordered, ended up contacting the gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist got the patient, looked at the study while we were on the phone, got the patient in the very next day for a procedure. Um, and then we were able to shift her care elsewhere and her chemo and treatment is underway. So it's not that care is not happening. It's just that we have to really make some shifts. So that's where patient advocacy becomes so important because you might find yourself having to push somebody um, out of their comfort zone to do things that they're not used to doing just because the circumstances call for it. Thank you. Does anyone else want to weigh in or we can move on? All right. Our second question from the audience is for everyone as well. 
on a spiritual level, what has been positive or negative for you all at this time? Um, I have uh, participated in more Bible studies, um, and I have found that Bible studies sometimes allow you to interact more with the word in a collective worship space than perhaps if you were coming to worship at a larger church, church as a congregant. And that has been a positive experience for me because um, I've been able to study the word more and sort of being held more uh, responsible uh, by the other people who are participating in these Zoom Bible studies. Um, my son is always here, so he's also always listening. And um, so like this morning, we had a pretty long worship se session together. Um, so it's been really, it's been really nice, even though I can't physically see and, you know, touch and hug, you know, everyone. It's, I've been spending more time in the word in a way that I didn't think that I would. Well, I completely agree. A lot of religious services have been moved online, obviously. My church has also been moved online. And so I really, whew, talk about timing, okay? Imagine if this pandemic happened with no technology. Whew, everyone has to read books. Mm. Anyways, um, how is anyone, how is everyone else doing? I know a lot of words that I've been seeing on social media are people are finding new meditation tactics. People are taking up yoga. You know, have any of you all incorporated any sort of new things into your life? That's exactly what I was going to share is that um, not being able to go to church and having Sunday be that day of worship. I find myself um, incorporating that into more of a daily practice. So um, doing a lot of journaling. I've always expressed gratitude, but I haven't always done it in a written form. Um and just seeking scriptures to carry me through the day, definitely yoga and meditation, which is very much a spiritual practice. Um, and just getting more in tune with hearing and listening to the voice of God, as opposed to always going um, in prayer and in supplication and making my requests. You know, I'm also taking that quiet time to hear and listen um, and see what messages God is sending to me, as opposed to waiting for Sunday to hear it through the pastor, um, like we're so accustomed to doing. So definitely there's been a shift there. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Please do not click off. We are going to go to a short two to three minute commercial break. Again, you are watching Afrique Today TV with the Patrick Foundation. We will see you all shortly. This is Vivian. She recently started a catering business, but like many other small businesses, she was struggling to get new clients. Growing a new business is never easy. She advertised her business on iWing Marketplace to increase her visibility and to attract more customers. Advertise your business like Vivian to attract potential customers no matter where you are in the world. It takes just seconds for customers to find you through the search engine or the category section. So don't wait. Advertise your business today on www.iwingmarketplace.com and increase your chances of being found by potential customers.
Being uncertain is no pleasant feeling. And when you have goals to hit, it's frustrating aimlessly working and not getting what you want. My name is Coach Donald, and if you find yourself in this place, GHP's online coaching may be a great fit for you. Whether that is prepping for your next races, season, or competitions, handling a nagging injury, or simply looking to become your best healthy self, our remote coaching is set up for you to win. From customizable training delivered seamlessly to your phone, guidance on injury and nutrition, accountability, and even video training sessions, having a coaching relationship with someone who actually cares about you and your family goes a long way. Connect with me to create a proven success plan and see our offerings. Leave your information on my website or send a DM to get started and learn why life-changing fitness is not simply a motto, but a way of living. Hello, thank you for tuning back in to A Freak Today and joining the Patcha Foundation for our live virtual wellness discussion. So in this second segment, we are going to be discussing legal matters, money, and just how to support your family during this time. Um, so starting off, counsel, I'll be turning to you, Ms. Orensby. Um, so, as you all know, courts are closed right now. We are still handling emergency matters, but counsel, what are some things that can be heard or like, what can I do if I have a so-called emergency? What is deemed an emergency, right? Sure. Um, so I handle mostly family law, landlord, tenant business matters. Generally in a business matter, you probably will not have an emergency your matter may feel urgent and it may be urgent, but it's not an emergency. <laughs> um, within the family law context, an emergency is usually a situation where there is risk of immediate harm to the individual that's at issue. So the most common example is a child who you believe um, or know to be at risk of neglect, physical abuse. The one, the cases that probably would not be heard right now are situations where you don't like how the child's being treated at the house, you know, the other parent's home. Um, but if you know that this, uh, this child is being beaten, not being fed, they're being left home alone um, for hours and hours and they're under an appropriate age, those may give rise to an emergency. The problem is that the court is pretty strictly screening these. So you really want to make sure that if you have a, a petition that you very clearly state why it's an emergency, why it has to be heard right now, and why you need immediate remedy. Um, if you sort of vaguely put, you know, the child is unsafe, you might not get a hearing. Um, and also you want to try and give notice to the other parent to um, make sure that you have better opportunity of being heard as well, if you can. Thank you. And so what about in relationships you are with your spouse, you are with, um, you know, potentially a boyfriend or a girlfriend? What about what can I do in a situation, for instance, what can somebody do if they are experiencing some type of assault or abuse, whether it be verbal, physical, sexually. Um, what can they do? What is, is that available while the courts close? Yes. Um, the commissioner's offices are open. You can go and file for a protective order 24-7 any day of the week. And it's very important to remember that you still have that recourse. Um, the police haven't shut down. Um, you know, they can still serve, you know, these protective orders. Um, and it's important that you take that step to protect yourself. Um, I cannot imagine what it must feel like to think that you are stuck in a home with an abuser and you don't have anything that you can do about it. Um, it is not an ideal situation because you won't get a final hearing for a while, but the temporary will stay in place until the courts reopen. And 
while the temporary is in place, if the other person violates the order in any way, call the police immediately. Um, a violation of a temporary order um, is arrestable. So if you are in an unsafe situation, please go to the court and file a, for a protective order. And so um, thank you for that, counsel. Um, Jasmine, I just turn into what uh, counsel Ornsby was just saying. Um, have you had to support any clients that may have been ha experiencing domestic violence during this time? Like for instance, they've been your client for a while and you're kind of aware of these issues that may be affecting their mental health. Um, what sort of things have you been telling them are available to them during this time? Or we've been talking about some of the buzzwords you and uh, Dr. Gaffney use were coping, right? Trying to make it through this time. Um, thank goodness I have not had a client that has had any abuse or intimate partner violence happening, but I have had clients that have reached out who are just not feeling good, like mentally and emotionally. Um, so if I am not available to speak with them, I definitely um, recommend them to contact like a, a hotline. So um, here in New York, we have NYC Well, and that's a, a mental health um, line where you can text, chat, or call. Um, so that's something that I have been recommending to clients and anyone who just may need that extra support and they may not have someone available to provide it. So NYC Well is 188-NYC Well, or they can text Well to 65173. And um, that's a place for them to talk to a professional um a crisis professional about what they're going through. Um, and then if the situation deems necessary, um, I'm pretty sure the police would still be um, sent to their residence um, if it's necessary enough. So um, as far as coping, I know coping is hard because a lot of our coping mechanisms tend to be outside the home. Um, but during this time, I find that I've been recommending things like a hot bath or a hot shower, um, aromatherapy if possible, lighting candles, listening to music, um, reading a book or reading a Bible or any type of religious literature. Um, and that's like emotion focused coping, but problem focused coping, things that we have control, I recommend reaching out to your tribe, um, reaching out to the people who are good for your mental health and who care about you and want to see you doing well. So reaching out to that person, just letting them know like, hey, hey girl, I'm not, I'm not feeling well today. Um, and I also recommend seeking a professional during this time. I know it's kind of hard to probably find a new therapist in general. So finding one during this time is hard, but it's never too late to begin the search. It's never too late to try to find a professional that you can reach out to. Um, a lot of colleagues are doing teletherapy right now. Um, some are taking on new clients. So I recommend, um, People looking on psychologytoday.com, that's a place where they, they can find a mental health professional with specializations. Also, they can put their insurance in to see if that person is eligible for insurance or a sliding scale. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that information. Um, that was actually something I was going to um, turn as to what, what types of services are covered. Um, we've talked about the legal stuff as to what you kind of can do if you do find yourself in these troubling uh, predicaments. Dr. Gaffney, do you have any perspective? Um, I know billing is very different in each sector. And then I know um, I actually have been working on an article for publication and just realizing that, um, you know, HHS has kind of, relieves you professionals a little bit in terms of what you can and can't do, the devices you can use um, to carry out these telehealth services. But the problem is, especially for you guys who are the providers, is is available. <laughs> yeah. So um, I just saw something today. It was an article um, on like a, a widely publicized like black social platform and it was saying oh now your doctors are going to charge you for things they ordinarily would have done for you for free 
Um, and so this idea that we're exploiting the situation for gain, um, whereas, you know, it, we have an expertise and a service to provide, um, and it's just reciprocity, you know. Um, so, yes, navigating all of these different platforms, is it going to be paid or reimbursed? Um, and, and something I'm very conscious of is, am I going to make a bill for my patient that they may not be able to pay, you know, because the bills are going to be produced um, where it's required and where I submit a bill for payment for services. But I'm also very cognizant of, um, am I disincentivizing my patient to show up for care on what, in whatever way they show up for care? If they feel like, oh my God, this is going to generate another bill, money is already tight and I'm not working, I, I'm not going to call and ask this question or I'm not going to get onto the telehealth platform because of what the cost out of pocket might be. But what might the cost be to your health and well-being is something I'm on the other side considering. So I think just like everything else and everybody else, we're just learning how to pivot. Mm -hmm. Um I personally have been seeking to utilize the telehealth platform for years. And so I'm sort of happy that my healthcare system's hand has been forced in allowing me to to do so, to provide services that way. Because every if somebody was just there last week, I don't need to examine them to review their blood work, but it is more than just a simple phone call. So we just want to provide the service and we want to be, I guess we want to be ethical about it. Is this language I'm looking for? Ethics are important, girl. Ethics are important. Um, So we've talked a little bit about engaging with clients and billables. Um, We definitely have that in the legal space, Um, but I'm interested to see um, Kendrick and Donald, you know, how is that billing aspect going for you guys? Are people, um, starting with you, Donald, for instance, um, I know Kendrick says he's virtual with his clients. Um, Kendrick has gotten my finances in check for sure, um, virtually. Um, but Donald, how about you? Are people expecting cost changes because they're not in person? You can't show them their form, even though you could send them a video. I know some people are different about that. Um, do you have any? Uh, insight on that to share with us? So being in that situation, it definitely required a pretty like adaptive response. And some of it was based on the community that I have with uh, the members. And so what we, what I did at first was, you know, going into April, I made sure that I went above and beyond in trying to provide support given that I wasn't there between having them, you know, most of them, their memberships are based on coming in gym two or three times a week but then it became all right we're going to do these video conferencing they're a little shorter they're not the same so you're going to just be able to come to as many as you possibly want to, um that, that are being offered and then really being more robust about the app that we use that their trainings on luckily we already had that um in, like installed so then it became your workouts are being uploaded on here and then just really doubling into the follow-up so you know people are hearing from me throughout the week through their phone way more than they ever did before between calls, texts, you know, videos sent to them and really trying to justify the billing because, you know, this is, I'm not Planet Fitness. Like I can't, I'm not going a whole month. Nobody paying me. That's just not going to be healthy. And so really going into making it simple. So I left all their billing the same and, you know, made a couple offerings to people who pay a little bit more. And then going into May, actually, I did um, knock the price down a bit, but I made it, tried to make something really simple and uniform. So some people got a big discount. Some people didn't really get much, but tried to make everything simple because it was, you know, based on how the in-gym stuff was, things were all over the place. And I just wanted to resolve it and make something really simple. And, you know, looking at even in the reopening process, how do I keep it simple, but, you know, scale back out? Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Yeah. And Planet Fitness is closed. That is my membership. And I'm a little bit salty about it. But, you know, thank God for YouTube and stuff. Um, So, Kendrick, interested to hear. I know you deal with a lot of um, 
big shot clients, physicians, lawyers. Um, physicians are still clearly going to work, but you know, maybe not a main priority with their finances. I'm sure they're working overtime. So the money is the direct deposit, direct deposit, sorry, is still flowing. But what about lawyers that you work with that, you know, maybe their big clients have slowed down or maybe they're working with small business owners. And so they might not be trying to talk about their finances. So how has that been in terms of, um, you know, Donna was talking about trying to keep clients engaged, making sure they're receptive and things of that nature. How's that experience been? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that our, our team has done, and I think this separates us from a lot of other firms, is we have an active call list of calling all of our clients back and checking in on them to see how they're doing. I think that separates a lot of advisors from others. Um, in regards to billing, to be completely honest, I think it always comes back to the budget because everybody is in a different space in today's time. So having that call with clients within our, our, our group and checking in on them, seeing what's changed, what new expenses have arisen, have arisen um, but also what are, what like what's really happening. And I think somebody brought this up before. You want to you want to share with the person that even though there's high emotions right now, you don't want to make too many drastic changes. Um, especially in regards to your finances, because a lot of folks do with their emotions, think about the short-term impact and not the long-term impact. So, you know, before making any you know, specific changes, I would always seek advice from a professional in regards to any subject matter, whether that's, um, you know, a therapist or, you know, your estate plan with an estate planning attorney or, you know, what have you. So. Certainly. Thank you for that. Um, so, just one last question that's a little bit family oriented, and I think this is going to turn to counsel, uh, Ms. Orensby. So what about custody matters? How, how is that dealing? How are you dealing with that? Do you still have to, I know many people are like, do I still have to pay child support? Do I still have to do this? Um, you know, if you have any personalized examples as to, you know, some scenarios that maybe our viewers can connect with, um, and things of that nature? Uh, sure. Uh, the most common issue that I'm facing is exchanges. Um, a lot of parents are concerned about COVID exposure with the child going back and forth. And when you have two parents who don't get along and who don't communicate anyways, they don't, they don't trust each other. And so what I'm sort of Finding myself as I'm stuck between two parents who don't want the child to go to either person's home. Um, the Maryland courts specifically addressed custody issues um, and said, hey, if you have a custody order, it remains in place. However, that does not mean that at least the advice I'm giving my clients um, if you have a reason to believe that your child is going to be exposed because of how the other parent lives or their lifestyle, I'm not going to necessarily discourage you from doing what you think is best. So uh, one example is um, the other parent is a ER doctor who has tested positive for COVID. They still wanted the child to come back and forth. I didn't think that that was a reasonable ask under the circumstances. But I have lots of other cases where both parents are quarantining as best as they can. I would not be able to really argue before a judge in the event of a contempt hearing why one parent's home was more safe than the other. So I try to talk to my clients to encourage them to discuss with the other parent what their quarantining um, schedule or you know lifestyle is so they can feel more comfortable. Um, I've also gotten a lot of questions about child support. Um, a lot of people are facing financial hardship on both sides and a lot of people who are paying child support have asked, well, you know, COVID, why should I have to pay child support? 
Well, because your child still has to eat and they still have to live, so you have to pay child support. Um, but that does not mean that if you have lost your job or your income has significantly reduced or changed, that you would not be able to file to modify child support retroactively. But right now, until the court rules on your request, you have to pay child support. And if you don't pay, you know, you just end up building up arrears or, you know, other financial penalties that may not be worth it. Um, but there's nothing about this pandemic that just automatically absolves you from paying child support. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's good to know that our obligations are still in place. And so um, speaking of obligations, um, and I think that Kendrick and uh, counsel again can kind of speak to this a little bit. Of course, we have obligations. We have leases, both from a residential perspective as well as the commercial perspective. Um, so, Kendrick, how are you advising, especially young professionals, to kind of restructure their budget in terms of paying rent um, and trying to just kind of keep up with things? Yeah. So there, there have been minimal instances where um, clients have talked about, you know, what can they do? I, I think the biggest thing is um, really, again, going back to those emotions. So how do you minimize expenses? I think a lot of folks now, nowadays are finding new ways to um, ramp up expenses. For instance, Amazon has been getting a lot of clients that we're talking to. They're not going out and eating dinner anymore, but now they're doing more shopping online. So it's really having that framework of, of, of calling them and telling them, hey, you know, when we spoke, this was the budget, understanding that things have changed. How has that changed? What are some new things that you're doing? What are some expenses that aren't there anymore? And how can we make sure we're still, you know, warehousing cash to, to be sure that, hey, you know, there's a lot of unknown and a lot of folks are getting furloughed and laid off. So we want to make sure that we have enough savings in place for the, for the worst case scenario. So it, it is very, very stringent on building up savings as one of the most important things that people can do. Yeah. So actually another question, like speaking to savings right now, we're kind of in a pandemic, right? So if you're already behind on, say, for instance, rent and things of that nature, Mr. Sanker, how do I kind of balance out, like, if I was saving, say, 200 to 500 a month now, but I have these, you know, new things, is there, is there areas where I can look in my budget that maybe aren't fixed expenses um, to kind of help me out? Or what, what do you think um, would help to kind of restructure some things so that, like you said, you, you can still accomplish your goals and not feel like you're bogged down in a sense? Absolutely. I think when, when we're looking at the budget, there's a couple of categories that have changed that aren't being filled now, like dining out isn't as uh, high as it used to be. Um, it might be, you know, personal care where, you know, you used to get a manicure or pedicure that is no longer on the budget. It might be uh, certain hobbies that she used to do, whether it's going to a sports game. So, you know, when you actually do take a look at some of the things that you used to spend maybe a good amount of money on, you, you can see where there's areas of opportunity. But I think um, I think the big thing about that is taking a step back to really visualize where was I spending money before and how can I take some of that and actually make a plan on, you know, supplementing what I need to do moving forward, whether that's, you know, paying rent or building savings in, 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 in that scenario. So I think taking that first step back is, is where a lot of folks are at right now mm -hmm. um, and actually coming back to that budget to see, okay, hey, what's changed again and, and how can I make some adjustments? Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Um, so I know that uh, a lot of people have been trying to invest during this time, especially our young fellow young professionals. Uh, does anyone have any insight, um, Kendrick, you can lead us, and then anyone else um, who may be small business owners and things of that nature, what are some, especially because if you're bored and you're going to go buy something on Amazon, why not invest it, right? Um, at least that's how I'm thinking. Like, how can I, um, for me, I'm looking into property. I had this discussion with Jessica the other day. I'm looking at remodeling my home so that when I move out of the home, you know, I can run this cash back. So it's like, you know, what are some strategies of investing into things? 
or what are some some places that young people can look into because they may be not as knowledgeable about it or they may only have say 50 to 100 dollars right yeah I, I think with that you definitely have to take a step back um always think about you know the risk as well as well as the reward so you know before moving forward and you know looking at a certain company that you want to invest in or before looking forward and, and thinking about you know what housing item can i purchase to make you know the, the prop the value of my property even higher i would say think about the risks and i think when i say that think about the unknown so a lot of folks believe that their job is really secure and always be hesitant with that. I, I, I can understand that as secure as you think your job is, there's always the unknown of what might happen, especially as we've seen. So I would first start with, do I have three to six months in savings? That's the first place that we generally start off in any kind of financial planning discussion. Do I have that three to six months? If not, how do I make sure I get there in the time that I have right now? Um, for our clients that have more than three to six months, it might be, again, like you said, some some opportunities, whether that's uh, increasing your 401k contributions at work. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that that's a great investment opportunity, especially long term, because you are effectively, you know, buying more shares when they're lower right now. So that is a great opportunity that folks can, can do um, with the time that they have today. Um, and there's definitely others out there. Um, but I think keeping it simple is the best thing that you can do. Certainly. Um, so, Donald, do you have any insight? I know you're a small business owner. Um, so curious to know if you have any insight as to how you've been managing your finances during those times. Do you have any insight for our young people? So for me at this stage, a big investment for me outside of just making sure I have cash put away and I'm, you know, slowly putting into IRA funds is really spending time working on what can I be better at to be able to generate more income. And so I've been spending a lot of time working on, uh, you know, learning how to do video editing, being able to, you know, do better marketing, but also learning how to, because I have extra time to spend to actually improving that skill, uh, even looking at certain rebranding pieces and, and finding how can I, you know, pivot just myself and to being able to have a bigger reach and be able to actually generate some more funds just because, you know, during the downtime, you know, things are uncertain. And so I need to make sure that I'm in a good position to go ahead and make the most of just who I am. And at this age, you know, I, having that time on the hand really allows me to kind of build on that skill. And so for me right now, it's, you know, cutting out a lot of the, you know, the expense that I don't need. I'm in the process of trading in some tech programs for other ones that are a little bit more robust, but actually cost less and being able to actually restructure how I'm running my business so that I can actually build it to be more profitable. Great. Sounds like you're doing some awesome things. Thank you for that. Um, and Jasmine, I know you have a huge social media following. I know that you post a lot of content that is probably applicable to your clients, but also people in your network. So has there been any new things that you've been picking up to kind of generate income, maybe outside of your practice that may be kind of intertwined as well? Yeah, social media is such a great way to, I guess, kind of increase your income and different things like that. So um, I've been thinking about different opportunities and better ways I can better serve myself. Um, there's also possible relocation. So I'm looking into all of the different ways that I can use social media and different avenues for my benefit right now. So yeah, I'm still looking. So I might need to see Kendrick after we get off this call to... <laughs> Get a little financial advice. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. That's good that you're thinking outside the box. So I know a lot of um, young professionals and just people in general have a lot of questions about landlord tenant issues and just your rental lease obligations. So Jessica, if you could kind of lead us in this segue, what are you know some of the things that you can do to approach that conversation with your landlord? Um, in terms of renegotiating the agreement 
or if you are potentially going to be behind. I know some people are like, oh, you know, I just got this stimulus check, but I'm not using it on rent or I know my landlord owns the property and they probably have some release from their mortgage. So I'm just nothing to pay. Um, so how do you approach these, you know, conversations? How do you go about that? Um, I think the best first step is to start the conversation, start the discussion. Um, a lot of people are afraid to go to creditors, go to their landlord and say, hey, this is my situation has changed. What can we do? Um, the good thing is that the pandemic is affecting everyone. So it won't be a surprise to your landlord to hear, hey, you know, maybe um, I lost my job or I'm not working as many hours or something like that. Um, a lot of landlords are taking advantage of sort of mortgage forgiveness programs that um, different companies are offering. And for a lot of those programs, a requirement is that if you are a landlord, you cannot charge rent during that time. Um, so if your landlord is in that type of a program um, and you have this conversation with them, they may very well say, you know what, it's, actually it's fine. You know, you, you have a couple of months you'll be, you'll be good. Um, even if they don't have that sort of reciprocity, there are, um, I know that there are some credit unions that are just offering um, mortgage forgiveness for a while. So it might not even have the requirement that they not collect rent, but if they've taken advantage of it and you reach out to them and say you're having difficulty, they may be empathetic. Um, now try your best to stay on top. You know, it's hard, but we all do have obligations and um, you don't want to dig yourself into a hole. Um, right now, your landlord cannot get an eviction against you. They have to wait until the courts reopen to start that process. But that doesn't mean that these months will be automatically forgiven by every judge just because. Um, what will probably happen is late fees will be waived, but the rent itself will still be um, will still be ordered as as a debt owed by you to your landlord. Um, and what's challenging, what I always find is challenging is, you know, now you're, everything's normal, it's July or August, I don't know, wishful thinking, but now you're trying to catch up and stay on top. And that's just a position you don't want to be in. So um, for residential leases, I would suggest calling your landlord, talking to them, being sensitive to the fact that they also have financial obligations because another issue that I've seen is a tenant doesn't pay, but then they are upset because the landlord isn't doing repairs. And I say, well, honey, you didn't pay rent, you know, and now of course the landlord is obligated to do what they're supposed to do, but it's that, that sort of like realization that this, we're all dependent on each other in our economic system. Um, so to answer your question in short, talk to the landlord um, and see if there's anything that you can do um, in terms of cutting down the payment or, you know, something um and then if you can't talk to kendrick and he will help you, <laughs> out, you know where you can squeeze out some pennies and if you do have a stimulus check um it might be a good idea to pay part of it to your rent at least a portion of it um that's not it's not a bonus you know <laughs> this is not an opportunity to go crazy on amazon or buy something you've always wanted it's to help you stay on top so <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Gaffney, this question is for you. Um, so just thinking of the business operational side of things, um, owning your own practice or even just, um, you know, hospitals even are a business, right? So mm -hmm. have you noticed any of your colleagues or you yourself having any issues being able to meet their obligations in those contracts, kind of talking to what um, counsel was speaking to before? Yeah, absolutely. So um, believe it or not, a lot of physicians have taken taken major hits. So um, I was in a physician group where several physicians had shared that they had just been 
fired, you know, without notice and fired without, you know, being given any particular reason. And the reason really is lack of finances coming into practices. Um, providers have been furloughed. Providers are taking pay cuts left and right. And, you know, some people are really scaling their business in this time, especially people who might have freestanding ERs or urgent care centers. Mm -hmm. Um, We've definitely had to decrease hours for our staff. Um, And it's twofold. One of it is a financial issue. So patients are actually afraid to come into the office, even when they need to physically be there. Some cases are just not appropriate for a phone call or a telehealth platform. Um, So business is definitely down. Um, And I know a lot of providers in private practices who are applying for the same um, small business loans that everybody else is um, and still seeking the same financial relief that everybody else is. Um, Healthcare providers, you know, I always say people see us with dollar signs in their eyes because they know that there are certain needs that we have and we cannot function on our own. We pay everybody else before we take home a dime. And so I've had to cut my staff by half um, and trying to be fair. So having my medical assistants alternate shifts as opposed to just giving them all to one or the other. Um, But yeah, so we're taking hits. We're having to adjust. um, We're having to pivot. And it's, um, and we don't know business. Like we don't learn business in medical (laughs) school. Um, So for those of us who are utilizing social media or those of us who are more business minded and business savvy, people are pivoting. You know, I have a lot of folks saying, well, why don't you do telehealth? And I'm like, I'm already exhausted. I'm already bringing home notes. I already am on call. I don't want to come home and see more patients. So, you know, I'm doing other things um, in order to bring an income that doesn't require me to see more patients. So it's just all about making that shift. Certainly. Thank you for that, Doc. Um, So I know that some people, we've been talking about contractual obligations, leases. um, And so, uh, Council, how would you address if someone's kind of borderline harassing you? I know some people have been, um, you know, They've gotten their stimulus check. Maybe they haven't paid their rent yet and the landlord is knocking on their door or um, kind of basically harassing them. What's what's the line on that? What is how do you draw those lines? Yeah, so for residential leases, your landlord does not have the right to infringe upon your space. It is your home, even though it belongs to them. And there are certain limitations to their access to your home. So I've heard a lot about landlords coming by and sort of doing like knocks, like, hey, rents due, rents due. Um, That might be annoying. um, But if they're not coming into your home, if they're not, you know, forcing themselves into your home, it might be okay. The issue is when landlords are trying to remove people, which is what I've heard, um, when they there are stories of landlords tracking people's um, stimulus checks. That's not legal. That's not OK. Um, and try trying to trade like barter, um, unfortunately, in some cases, sexual favors for rent. That's not OK. Um, there are. <laughs> There are a lot of landlords who don't understand the limit of what they can do to enforce payment. You enforce rent payment through court. You, as a landlord, don't get to, you know, physically impose yourself upon your your tenant to get payment. Um, If you feel that you're being harassed, just like if your landlord came into your home without notice, you could call the police. You have a claim for trespassing. Um, Do the same. Um, if your landlord, if you find out that they've been checking your mail, um, tracking your your funds, you should consult with an attorney to see what your remedies are. Um, those are unacceptable actions. And yes, it can feel like nothing will be done for a little while because of the courts, but you absolutely have remedy. And if it, if it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. So talk to a lawyer. Certainly. 
So we have a lot of questions um, for counsel and Mr. Sanker. So I'm going to read out um, some questions from our audience. Of course, any of you can chime in if you have perspective or if you have um, personal uh, insight. So the first question is, there is a bill being pushed through Congress, Congress to waive rent. How would that work? I so on my social media, I will poll uh, different thing, poll questions, you know, just to see people's perspective. And that was actually a question that I that I posed was, "Do you think rent should be waived?" And I was surprised to learn that most people were. It was like fifty fifty. Um, the problem is if you stop rent, then you have to also talk to the mortgage the mortgagers and say, you can't charge them mortgage. Um, and every company is not on board with not collecting mortgage payments at this time. So I think that the, the windfall of that would be a little difficult um, to, it would be difficult to get it. If I'm not paying rent, my landlord's not getting their money, they're, now they're in trouble. Um, and then I mentioned earlier the issues with maintenance. You still have to pay for maintenance. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a large building, they have um, they have they have different like pest control servicers, contractors. They have to pay. Um, so I think it's a it's a bigger issue than just not paying rent. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mr. Sanker, you know what are some of the things that you know, someone who's, I think the question was, how can we, if we're potentially thinking about moving out, right, maybe your plan was to always move out of your apartment or your condo, how can you position yourself to have those funds despite of this circumstance? So like counsel said, you and, you know, even uh, Dr. Gaffney said, you already can't pay the bills to manage your business or to manage your residential space. So how can someone position themselves to be able to um, be financially stable and not kind of put themselves in a hole, but still be able to accomplish that goal to move uh, despite the circumstances we're kind of going through at this time. Yeah, I would be, I think you hit the nail on the head. I would definitely have a better understanding of everything that's going around. So, you know, practicing hesitancy um, and building cash because there's, when, when you make a move into whether it's a new apartment or a new home, even me, I, I moved into DC about two months ago, and there's a lot of unexpected expenses that you just do not think about. And, you know, given today's environment where income, you know, cash is king, income is king, you don't know if you're going to get paid, um, just practicing hesitancy because do you want to give up something that you've been saving up for for the past two years, which is the cash in your account? Um, or do you want to wait it out? You know, practicing that, that, you know, patience and saying, okay, hey, what is the next two months of me just staying put, you know, finding myself, um, building up my cash a little bit more and, and before I take this next leap of faith? Um, as, as great as it might seem. And then, of course, now there's unexpected, unexpected expenses with furniture and just things that you may not be thinking about. I mean, I know even myself as a financial advisor, um, there's expenses that I wasn't thinking about. Um, right. I, I'm, I'm even I'm, I'm a human being at the end of the day. So there's just natural things that or inclinations that you have, um, such as eating out more uh, or getting more groceries um, that you just don't think about. So I, I would just be very hesitant or you just take actions based on emotions. Sure, sure. Does anyone else have any insight as to what they've kind of rearranged personally? Um, Jasmine or Donald or Dr. Gaffney, we haven't heard from you in a little while. I know these questions are kind of the legal and financial questions. People are eager to get their finances in order. Looks like Kendrick and Jessica are about to have some new clients after this. <laughs> One of the things um, that I'm a subscriber. It's like, oh yeah, I'll take that. Mm -hmm, I'll have that. Um, that's only ten dollars a month. Throw it in there, and it's like unsubscribe. <laughs> in that, take off that subscription. Can't go to massage and be get that out of here. Um, and really being cognizant of saving that money, like not looking at it as, oh, I freed up all this money now I can you know blow it out on Amazon or whatever. 
um, and really shifting my thinking. So um, I have some things on the horizon that will generate some more income. And what I, what this situation made me do was take a step back and not say, oh, it'll ease up the household finances or, um, you know, let me double up on my student loan payments. So I'm like, no, let me invest those earnings um, yeah. and not send them to my checking account. So um, just being, yeah, more mindful of making investments and getting monies together for the future. I've already found myself in the position where I had to stop working, couldn't generate an income. And that three to six months of money that you have in the bank, it, it goes really quickly. And you're not always able to bounce back or return to normal in three to six months. And so we really have to think about, um, we have to think in the long term. I think that's something that we just fail to do. We're very short-sighted. We're very, you know, instant gratification nation. And, you know, all of the technology and the social media just kind of fuels that. So just taking a step back um, and just really eliminating um, those automatic payments or those payments that come out of things that you don't think of and don't think of that money as freed up to spend. Yeah, go see Kendrick and invest <laughs> that money. <laughs> I'm trying to tell y'all, Kendrick will check you. He has certainly checked me and I've accomplished so much. I'm very um, excited to make more lawyer money. I'm excited for my money clock to go up because I know when I get a whole bunch of money, it won't go crazy dealing with Kendrick because he'll check you. Um, <laughs> So a question for, um, the question says, what resources and legal protections are available for those who can't afford rent or mortgage payments during this pandemic? And I think you kind of addressed that a little bit, talking to kind of how you can renegotiate um, those agreements and things of that nature. But I guess what are, what are the resources available immediately that you can kind of seek, where would you direct somebody? And I guess this question is technically for Ms. Hornsby. Um, so I actually just saw that um, in Maryland, they have rolled out EARP, e um, a program for Montgomery County residents to assist um, with the, their issues financially. Now, if you're not in Maryland, that's not super helpful. Um, it's it's challenging because from what I'm seeing, it's sort of like jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So Montgomery County has that program, but then Maryland broadly has um, or is rolling out a renter assistance program. And so I would encourage you to look at um, the updates for whatever state that you're in, the um, governor's updates and see what programs they are considering and which ones have actually been put into place. Um, because you might be surprised to learn that there are a lot more resources uh, available than, than you thought. Um, in DC, they have um, bread for, I want to say bread for the city, Catholic charities. Um, at the beginning of the year, they sort of build up their budget to assist individuals who get um, judgments entered against them. Um, so no one wants a judgment because it's a judgment. Um, but I have seen some tenants take advantage of that where they ask the judge for a judgment so that they can then have the balance paid by these organizations and then they're able to stay in their home. Um, if you're in the district, that might be something that you wanna take a look at, but keep in mind that they do run out of funds. And there will be a lot of people who are also seeking assistance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the extent of what I know of off the top of my head. Okay. And uh, thank you for those responses. And just a quick reminder to our viewers, we are tuned in to Afri today. So make sure that you like, comment, subscribe. If you haven't um, posted a, a question or anything of that nature, please like, comment, and subscribe. Um, a freak today TV again, and as well, of course, follow the Patcha Foundation. Um, so now um, our audience is asking a lot of questions. So now um, we've talked about landlord tenant issues. We have talked about some financial issues. So turning to, ooh, this is actually a real spicy question. Um, so for young people entering adulthood, Dating is somewhat challenging. 
Is it made more complicated by COVID-19? Will it be like HIV where folks are encouraged to know their status and share it with potential partners? Hello, Jasmine and Dr. Gaffney, what you got for us? Because <laughs> this sounds like right up your alley. So um, one of the things I think about that's great about dating in COVID 2019 is you can't get together. And so having to just talk, having to um, having the relationship live where it truly lives, which, which is within your conversation and your engagement with one another um, is all that there is to have right now. If, if you're not violating the social distancing rules. So there's no confusion of, do I like this guy or girl, or do I just like how they're dressed up at the moment? Do I like this guy or girl, or do I just like that they could take me to restaurants I don't have access to? Do I like this person, or I just <laughs> like that they're adventurous, and I get to do all these fun things with them, but I don't actually like them. So it's real. I've been saying all along that this whole COVID 2019 and social distancing and quarantining is going to make or break relationships because all we got is each other right about now. Um, in terms of uh, what is someone's COVID status? Yes, that's something that um, I have considered with other healthcare professionals. Like, is it going to be something else that we stigmatize and, you know, mm -hmm. hold against people? Um, it technically, it shouldn't matter because we shouldn't be together, right? We should be distanced, but it is something okay. to consider and to keep in mind is, you know, do you know your status? How do you know you haven't, um, encountered this virus? How do I know you can't spread it to me? Because remember people can have the infection and can spread it and not have symptoms at all or have very mild symptoms where they wouldn't suspect it. Um, so as someone who takes care of people who have HIV, as well as someone who's very active in helping people prevent HIV infection, I take stigma very seriously. And it's mm -hmm. something I'm always trying to fight and combat. Um, and the way that we combat stigma is just to educate, inform, and enlighten. So hopefully it doesn't turn into that. But I think, you know, just all of us being here on this platform and our respective platforms continuing to educate and spread the truth about this situation is what will help prevent that stigma. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for those points, Dr. Gaffney. And I find that um, I have done some work, some legal work with the HIV population as well. And stigma is hugely, is greatly associated, sorry. But I find that those individuals are some of the greatest, um, you know, greatest individuals. They're very bold. They're able to talk about, have these basic conversations. Um, and so I guess just making it even more personable. Um, Jasmine, I know that you deal with clients and having these kind of probably helping them navigate through conversations. And, you know, how do you have these conversations if, you know, maybe you're just talking to someone, you're in a situation, situationship as the millennials call it, whatever you may have going on. And, you know, people are trying to have kickbacks and trying to hang out but I don't know where he's been. Like, you might be a whole doctor or a first liner. I don't want to hang out with you if you've been, you know, hanging out with different people. So how do you have these conversations? Because I know that some people, they just simply don't get it. And millennials, we're very itchy. We don't, we don't know how to sit on our behind, as my mom would say. Um, yeah, it's been a conversation I've been having. I work with adolescents, um, a lot of adolescents and millennials. So... I have just been trying to stress and advocate for sitting at home. Mm -hmm. um, but for the people that are in situationships or relationships or just trying to date, um, I have been advocating for it. This is like Dr. Gaffney said, this is a great time to date. Like there's no pressure about when we're going to see each other. There's no pressure about being pressured into things that you don't want to do or any of this, like it's literally, you can sit on the phone, you can sit on FaceTime or whatever you have and get to know each other and have a real conversation. And also there's not the pressure of like, hmm, maybe I'll give it a second day. Like if you can't connect over the phone, you probably won't connect in person. So it's like, it takes some of that pressure <laughs> off as well, being honestly speaking. And I think this is a great time for people in relationships 
to get to know each other, to reconnect. We have nothing but time at home aside from working from home. So this is a good time to better learn your partner, better learn them, hear what's going on in their life. Because I think we have been so caught up um, in day-to-day life and so busy that people change. And it's like you don't quite recognize those changes. So I think this is a great time to reconnect in your relationship or in your situationship or with your new <laughs> any, any it's a good time to reconnect and it's a good time to take some of that pressure off. Um, especially if you like have anxiety or social anxiety or different things like that. Sure. But- so we heard from the ladies. Thank you, Jasmine, by the way. Um Thank you, Jasmine. So uh, we've heard from the ladies. Do the males have any perspectives? I know that y'all are very um, strategic in the dating world. So we'd love to hear what you guys have to say um, and maybe how you've been kind of navigating the scene from a personal perspective. Or maybe advising your friends, help a friend, tell a friend, Kendrick or Donald, if you have any insight. I think a good point was brought up that you just don't know where others have been. Um, and that's something that you always be, want to be wary of. I mean, a, a lot of the times we're always thinking about ourselves and not thinking about the impact that we have on others. So um, that's something that I'm always thinking about. I think one of the funniest things that was brought up to me, of course, with some of these dating apps, is I think it's funny that these dating apps are like great things to do. But, you know, in today's time, you, you might like somebody, but you still can't see them because we're right. not the right <laughs> Um, I think it's just, um, as, as you all said before, it's a time for you to really get to understand a person, get to know them in a way that you may not have before, um, but always just, pra- just understanding the implications of your actions and you know, where that might lead you. So. Certainly. Thank you, Kendrick. Do you have any insight, um, Donald? Yeah, definitely going back with what uh, Jasmine had mentioned and really finding that time to actually reconnect. When I think about my, my partner lives out of town. And oh, wow. so there's that whole like separation piece. And it really goes into like, all right, really refiguring out, you know, what makes you attracted to this person? What makes you, uh, what, what do you have in common? You know, what differs? And really being able to understand what are those main things that, you know, that flow really well or things that you really have to compromise with and finding other ways to be able to enjoy each other because you're not able to physically be there and really understanding like, you know, if, if this were to happen again, like how would you do, how would you handle that? Um, you know, in, in different scenarios that could come up, this is trying and it wasn't planned. And so even when things uh, can be rough, like, you know, my partner or my, my friends, you know, different things come up and it's like, is this like an actual personality thing or is this like, can we just blame this on COVID and people just being frustrated and anxious and, um, you know, being able to <laughs> actually have an understanding of if you can handle this, then there's a lot of other things you can probably be able to handle together. Thank you. It was lovely to hear the male perspective. I always like to get that insight because, you know, us, us women of color, they say we're a little too bold and we're, you know, independent and got our own um, perspectives and things of that nature. So uh, we are looking at about seven more minutes and we have a couple more questions from our viewers. So the last question, uh, of course, anyone, I think, uh, I'm sure everyone wants to hear from Kendrick, but uh, I think all of you guys as young professionals can certainly offer some insights. So the question is, what do you think this COVID-19 has this COVID-19 season, sorry, has taught you about yourself in general and your financial life. How can people maintain the great things learned during this time, such as spending less and better money management? Yeah, I think it's it's allowed people to take a step back. I mean, what we're in, we're in May, we're five months in, so it's allowed you to take a step back and take a look at what have you done within the last five months financially. Um, I'm a big guy, big proponent of systems. So when you think about systems, habits, what habits have you started since January when you made your New Year's resolution? Um, given the challenges that you've made, you know, how, what has that done? For me, I'm a systems guy for savings, you know, automatic savings, automatic IRA contributions, automatic 401k contributions. Whenever we're talking to a lot of clients, 
Um, the reason why they're as successful and financially successful as they are is because they build good systems. So I think um, when we take a look at, you know, even myself grasping what I've done, it's always looking at, okay, how have things changed with COVID-19 and how can I ramp up my systems now that expenses have gone down? So uh, maybe that's a slight tweak in your savings. If you were saving 500 a month, like you shared, and now you have a little bit more discretionary income, might as well bump that automatic 500 a month to 600. Challenge yourself and seeing if you yeah. can. Certainly. Um, uh, Jessica, do you have anything that you've learned during this season or something that I know you said that you have a little one on the way that's so exciting? Has Have you learned anything during this time and, you know, coming out into recovery mode? Is there anything that you think you can share from this season that you've learned? Certainly. Um, so my husband and I are very, we are extroverts. We are a thousand percent extroverts. We're always hosting something. There's always somebody at our house. And right before COVID, um, I, I habitually go through and categorize all of our spending. Right before COVID, I'm embarrassed to say we have spent $1,800 on food in addition to groceries just because we were hosting so many things at our house. And, oh my gosh, are you, what are we doing with our lives? <laughs> like we're not rich, <laughs> but that's what we were doing. And now that we can't have people over, now today's nice. And he said, oh, we should barbecue. Let's go get stuff. No, we have food in the house. We can grill <laughs> if you want to put something on the grill. So what, we, what I have learned is that um, we need to find a way to be social without waste without being wasteful um since i am expecting we've tried to limit even like um ordering food and mm -hmm. like, look look at how much we're saving with our our food budget um and finding other ways to entertain ourselves that's free we don't have to order the new movie that just came out you know, on, you know on, on demand for $20, we can find an old one that we know that we like. Um, something else that I actually discovered this morning when I was sending my financials to my accountants was um, how much I was save, like areas I could save in my business. Um, now, I still kept the same budget for my employees, but seeing if there were ways that um, maybe some of the automatic um, subscriptions for business services that we weren't really using. I noticed them in, in the statements today. So we're not even using that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so doing it, an audit, a self audit, I think is also important. Even if you have a Kendrick or you have um, someone else who's helping you take a moment to look at your, your financials yourself and see if there are ways that, that you can cut back. So I'm hoping that when the world reopens, we won't keep having functions and <laughs> spending money unnecessarily. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, do you guys, uh, Jasmine and Donald, do you have any closing remarks? We have one more question, which I really wanna get to, because I think that Jasmine will have some great insight to and probably the rest of you guys, but, um, Donald and Jasmine, do you have any insight as to kind of what you've learned in this season and going forward? Um, Brief. Just really quickly, I have just learned to express a lot of gratitude in this season. Um, it's been so uncertain for everyone, but I have been grateful enough to be in a great position. And I think that's the thing that I've learned. And I've also been saving because I have been sitting my butt in the house. I have not left. So I have really been learning to just be grateful for what I have and the people I have around me that are still supporting me from afar. So just briefly. Aww, that's awesome. So one last question. A uh, viewer on YouTube says there has been uh, probably potential chance of long-term social distancing and potentially the impact on mental health. Um, what can you do to better handle re-entering outside, as the millennials call it, when outside opens? Um, and so 
We have uh, 30 seconds. I don't know, Donald, if you have some remarks and then Jasmine, our mental health person, can kind of wrap us up a little bit. Um, you know, being able to get out and figure out how you're going to re-enter, looking at what are the things that you want to do and what kind of protocols are they going to have to allow you to do that. Um, you know, I would advise against going into things that are just outright unsafe that, you know, could cause us to have to re-enter the situation. But being able to find uh, businesses, events, organizations that are really taking precautions to making sure that things are safe and being able to veer yourself that way. Awesome. Thank you. So just really quickly before uh, Khadija and I close, um, if you all could kind of share your social media and uh, just drop it real quick and then we got to close. So Jessica, if you want to kind of share your social media and then we can go down the line. Sure. Um, Instagram, DMV underscore lawyer. Um, and you can get in contact with me there. All righty. I think I follow you. Oh, good. Hey. Yes. How about you, Donna? What's your um, social media handle so we can get our get snatched and stuff from outside? <laughs> so follow me on Instagram at coach underscore Donald. Uh, it's also the same on YouTube, uh, Coach Donald on YouTube. Uh, our Facebook page is Global Human Performance, but far more active on Instagram. Awesome. How about you, Dr. Gaffney? Are you on social media? How can we get our tips? I am. So you can follow me at Dr. Alexia, so D-R-A-L-E-X-E-A, -E -E at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, and if you are a breast cancer survivor or if you're at risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancer, you can follow me at Breast Cancer Beautiful on Facebook. All righty. Kendrick, social media? Yeah, my, my, my Instagram is no, not Kendrick Lamar. That's no, not Kendrick Lamar. Oh, okay. Okay. And Jasmine, she always has a great positivity aspect. What's your social media, beautiful? I am Miss Belvin, M-I-S-S-B-E-L-V-I-N underscore. So be sure to get all of your mental health tips and wellness tips and all the empowerment and things of that nature. All righty. I hope that you guys have really enjoyed tuning into us. Thank you so, so much, Afrique, today uh, for having us on this platform um, and having the Passion Foundation and all our panelists. We thank you for all your insight on the finances, the legal tips, the fitness, um, and our health professionals as well. So once again, like, subscribe for future. Uh, we hope to be able to come on this platform again and do some, um, you know, just have some discussions and share good information and just keep you guys moving. We are stepping into recovery and it shall be well. Um, Khadija, do you have any closing words for the people? Yes, of course. I just, again, want to thank all of our wonderful panelists that joined us today. Please be sure to do yourselves a big favor and head to all of their social media accounts. Okay, you need to emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic, a brand new holistically healed person. Get those finances in check. Get a lawyer in check. Let Donald get that body right. Jasmine got you with the mental health. Come on, y'all. Dr. Alexia is here to provide y'all some services. So please do yourself a favor and get in contact with, these, with all the panelists that we had today. And again, if you're looking to host a TV show, please see Afrique Today TV. Reach out to them. It's been an excellent time here with you all. The Patch Foundation truly thanks you all for joining us today. Panelists, thank you all so much for sharing your expertise. Everyone, please stay safe. Keep that six feet distance. I know it's hard. We're going to be back outside before we know it. Thank you all so much. Yes. And please let us know, um, us junior associates, we kind of want, as from the Patchett Foundation, let us know if there's any other topics you'd like to discuss and we'll, we'll give it to y'all. We got a lot to talk about. Um, I am a new young lawyer, so I like to talk. So anyways, thank you all for tuning to in. Thank you at Freak Today. Um, Continue to support our freak today. They've been great to work with. Have a blessed day, everyone. And once again, thank you, thank you, thank you.
that Fatal Foundation succeed to recharge my battery. I'm a very, very happy guy. You know, sometimes you are doing things and uh, you don't know you continue as usual. But when I came with Patrick Foundation, with all the talk, with all the advice, I succeed to recharge my battery and have new objectives. So now I'm going to raise all my actions. I'm going to do more and I pray God that he helped me to continue to do this uh, amazing work. Uh, I think with the help of all those who promise, we are going to do more. Thank you for all. Thank you, Pacha. Thank you, Faboni. Thank you, all the people who did their best to make my stay marvelous. Thank you. Bye-bye.